Church, I have, a, um, I have a difficult sermon to share with you this morning. Um, it's one that is likely going to be shocking to many of you, and I want you to know right off the bat that I have prayed for you many times over the last several days as I've prepared this sermon. As I work through what I've got to talk about, I want to encourage you to hold on to everything that you know to be true of God. Hold on to the fact that he is faithful. Hold on to the fact that in a world of change, he is the one, he is the only one who never, ever changes. And I'm going to begin um, my time sharing with you a letter that I wrote to the deacons and to the congregation of Salem Baptist Church. I shared this with the deacons on Thursday evening. I share it with you now. Dear Salem Baptist Church deacons and congregation, When the Lord called my family and I to move to Winston-Salem and serve at Salem Baptist Church in 2014, we came with great excitement and anticipation of what God might want to do through our ministry here. And in this time, we've been blessed by this church, and God has used it to sharpen us and grow our faith. Over the past several years, we've sought to live by faith, trusting that God knows what he's doing, even when we don't fully understand how he's going to accomplish his plan And when a Christian lives by faith, God calls them to things that aren't always easy. For months, Hillary and I have prayed for the Lord to do what he wants with our lives, with our family, and with our church. We shouldn't be surprised that when we surrender to him, he leads and guides in unique and specific ways. Through prayer and seeking godly counsel, we've realized that he has released us from ministering at Salem Baptist Church. And I am resigning from my role as pastor. My last Sunday will be March 12th. This is not a decision made lightly and is one that has been agonized over for some time. But since Hillary and I surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit to resign, a peace that can't even be described has filled our hearts and minds. We don't know where the Lord plans to take us next. We believe that the first step of faith in resigning from Salem is necessary before clarity can come about our next assignment. Salem will always hold a special place in our hearts, and we wish the best for this church as you move forward. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the whole reason this church exists. We love you, Pastor and Hillary. Now, I realize that this likely comes as a shock to many, and um, it's going to take some time to process but I would not be doing the, ch- the job of, of shepherd that I've been called to unless I point us to where hope is found and where encouragement can be found. Take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 20, and I hope that in these next few moments, God's Word will provide some clarity for us and some encouragement. Acts chapter 20 is where you're going in your Bibles. And here's the context of what's taking place in, in Acts chapter 20. Arguably, Paul's most beloved church was the church in Ephesus. He spent more time in Ephesus than in any of his church plants. Uh, The people were precious to him. There was a general sense of Ephesus being Paul's favorite. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, the Holy Spirit lays it on the heart of Paul that he is to head to Jerusalem. And it seems like Paul is, know that he knows that he is heading to Jerusalem to die before long. In fact, I can't help but think about Jesus and Luke, where he turns his face, he sets his face towards Jerusalem, knowing that he's going there to die. And in much the same way, Paul is doing this as he heads to Jerusalem. So Paul sails for Jerusalem, but he wants to be there before he gets to Pentecost. Pentecost has become a Christian holiday, and he wants to celebrate this holiday with the Christians in Jerusalem. Time is tight. Um, He doesn't have time to delay anywhere. God has called him. He must go. So even though the church in Ephesus is so precious to him and it's on his way as he's sailing for Jerusalem, he doesn't stop in Ephesus on his journey. Instead, he puts in at Miletus, which is a town about 20 miles south of Ephesus. He then sends messengers from Miletus to Ephesus and sends for the elders of the church of Ephesus. He says, come to me here in Miletus. The elders come, and Paul gives his farewell address to these elders. And we're going to read that here in a moment, but 
This is an emotional meeting. Um, In fact, if you jump down to Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 36, when he's done sharing with them this charge, here's what happens, starting in verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all, but they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Grieving in change is normal. Uh, Lord knows that Hillary and I have grieved as the Lord has brought us into this very difficult decision. The relationship between a shepherd and his sheep is unique, and there is a bond that is not easily broken there. For these last six and a half years that I've served as your pastor, with, with two years before that serving as youth pastor, we built a strong relationship. And we're still going to be friends. We're going to see each other in heaven one day, too. We'll spend eternity with each other. But another pastor is going to come and shepherd you after me. And our relationship is not going to be the same. And it's okay to grieve that. It's actually, it's right to grieve that. These elders in Acts chapter 20 and and really the church at large in Ephesus grieved this change. It was tough for them. Let's go back and start reading in verse 17. Let's see what Paul said to these elders. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the prayers that I pray constantly is, Lord, I want to honor you no matter what. I want to honor you no matter what other people think. I, know, I, want to add, I want to honor you no matter what you call me to. I want to honor you no matter what. And I've come to this passage multiple times over the years, and I've prayed through this passage that Paul's declaration here near the end of his ministry would be able to be my declaration when God saw fit to move me from Salem. Now, I've prayed in the past that God would leave me and Hillary at Salem for the rest of our lives. We love this church, we love this city. But for whatever reason, the Lord has seen fit not to do that. And that's all right. For the last six and a half years that I've been here as, as pastor, I would say it's probably, actually no, I would not say, it is the hardest six and a half years of my life. I was green and I was unexperienced when you called me at 29 years old to be your pastor. The refiner's fire of ministry and of service to the Lord is a really hot fire. But the beauty of that hot fire is that it burns away the excess to where at the end of it, all you want and all you realize you really need in life is Jesus. And in this time, Jesus has grown sweeter and sin has grown more and more bitter to me. That's something that you've had a hand in teaching me. One of the things that I think about in these last several years, and I echo with Paul, Paul says, I did not shrink from you in declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you. He was preaching the gospel. I didn't know much about pastoring when I became your pastor. But I knew that I couldn't go wrong with the gospel, and that's what I resolved to preach and to live. This church has a responsibility moving forward to always preach repentance of sin and faith in Jesus alone for salvation. And I I, I charge you, never ever allow any pastor, member, church attender, no one to preach anything other than Jesus and him crucified. That is where you will never, ever go wrong. Here's what Paul says next, starting in verse 22. He says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Hillary and I don't know what's next. Now, I don't think it's going to Jerusalem to be ready to die, but we don't know. 
What we do know is that we are constrained by the Spirit, believing that God has a plan for our family. You say, well, pastor, can't you stay at Salem until the Lord directs your next steps? And you know, sometimes that's how God works. Sometimes God calls a pastor from one place to go directly to another place. But in this case, he has not. Hillary and I have a conviction that God is calling us away from Salem before he calls us to whatever is next. And to do anything different would be in direct defiance to what he has clearly led us to do. He has spoken. We will obey no matter what. I've preached obedience to Jesus no matter what he calls us to do. What kind of pastor would I be if I preached that, but then when the Lord is calling us in a specific way, I didn't model that for you. And as the Lord has led, and he clearly has, as he has led, we are are responding. We don't know how our family might be provided for. We don't know where God might call us. Um, We don't know the answers to a whole lot of questions. But there is a peace that comes with this that I can't even begin to describe. Knowing without a doubt that our God is faithful. That he has not let us down one time in the past and he won't do it in the future at all. Anything less than complete obedience is not acceptable. And our God deserves so much more than partial obedience. Here's the next verse. Here's what he says next. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. And then here's his prayer. Here's his desire. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. One thing I know for certain, and I think that is very consistent with what we see here in Paul, that God has called me to preach the gospel. I don't know where he's called me to preach the gospel, but I hope and pray that I'll be able to do that till the day I die. Because there's very few things in this life that bring any more satisfaction and joy to me than being able to do so. I want to be faithful to finish the race that the Lord has laid out for me and be strategic to serve the Lord where I've got the greatest level of kingdom impact possible. And as long as I was here, that was the Lord's way of saying, here's where you have the greatest level of kingdom impact. But as soon as he turned us loose, he's saying, now I've got somewhere else for you to go have an impact. My prayer is that you view your life in the same way. That you desire to be faithful to God no matter what. That you proclaim the gospel wherever you go. That you are looking to have a kingdom impact with your life. When I read this verse coming from Paul here, talking about finishing his course, I think about C.T. Studd's poem that the refrain says, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. There's a lot of things I enjoy doing in this world. Friday, it was a really nice day. I went fishing for a while. And it was awesome. I love doing that. But I also know without a doubt that the most satisfaction that I get in life is obedience to the Lord. And I know without a doubt, I've only got a short amount of time to live on this earth. And in that short amount of time to live, I'm going to live it in complete obedience and lead my family in living in that way. There is nothing in this life more important than to be characterized by God as living in complete submission to what he calls us to. It doesn't matter how scary it is. God, where might you send us? It doesn't matter how much it moves us from what is comfortable or what it costs of us, it doesn't matter. Our lives are only as valuable as the value that Jesus gives us. And nothing is more important than Jesus. Paul also, we see here, had a clear conscience in verses 26 and 27. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, he says. Now, I'm sure that in the last six and a half years, if I had those to live over again, there's some things that I probably would have done a little bit differently. Who cannot look back on their life and say, you know, I wish I'd have done these things a little bit differently. But I can, with a clear conscience, say that I have sought to honor the Lord with my ministry and to lead and serve him in a way that is ethical and that is godly. 
And there's a ton of freedom in having a clear conscience. I know that I'm fallible, and I know that periodically I'm going to sin, and I'm going to do some things that don't honor the Lord. But what beauty there is in holding that, that short account, not letting the sin stack up, saying, God, I want your presence more than anything else. That's been my prayer the last several years. And boy, what a freedom prayer that is. Paul then turns his, his, uh, his attention to some instruction for the church. He knows he's not going to see them again. He knows that there is a um, high chance that he won't live much longer. So what are these words that he wants to give to the church as he's parting? And he starts this in verse 28. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears. Now remember, this is Paul speaking to these Ephesian elders. He tells them to watch out for both themselves as leaders, and to the flock, to the whole flock. Jesus, when he was teaching in John chapter 10, uses this analogy of a sheep to describe the church. Paul uses the same thought process. One of the jobs of the shepherd is to guard the sheep, protect the sheep. The shepherd stands in the gap and, using the language of this passage, protects the sheep from fierce wolves and from perverted and evil sheep who would rather draw other sheep away from God. For the first couple of years of serving as pastor, I would, um, I would go on vacation and I would come back on, from vacation. It seemed like every time I came back, I was bombarded with conflict and with controversy. It made me not want to go on vacation for a while, knowing what I was in for after I got back. There is something about the under-shepherd stepping away, even for a short time, that led angry, even evil people to do and say things that they would never say and do while I was present. And that's not because I'm anything special. It's because God has orchestrated the, the role of an under-shepherd in a very specific way. Over the past several years, I've prayed a very specific prayer when I travel or when I'm away on vacation. And that is that God would protect our church from satanic attacks through people. Maybe it's them airing their grievances. Maybe it's any, any sin that just comes out. But regardless, they're used by Satan to sow discord and disunity. Paul knows what he's talking about here. He's seen it. He's felt it. He's, he's stood in the gap for years, pouring out his heart before the Lord and praying that this precious church that Jesus had bought and paid for with his own blood would not be torn apart by ungodly people. That is now the prayer that every single leader and member of Salem Baptist Church must pray. God, protect us from those who would try to pull us apart. Unify our hearts and minds. Put us together in such a way that when we move forward, we are moving as one unit, not as a bunch of separate cliques. It is on the heart of God for this church to point people to Jesus, to not get distracted by anybody's personal agenda, to let the only agenda that is allowed a voice be the one that Jesus has for his church. It is on the heart of God for Salem Baptist Church to reach the lost with the gospel, both here in Winston-Salem and around the world. It is on the heart of God for people to be pointed to the salvation and the life that is found only in Jesus. That is the heart of God for this church. So hold to that. And lastly, look at verse 32. Paul says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That word commend literally means to place beside or to present to. Paul says, I'm placing you beside, church. I'm presenting you to God. My job with you is done. God is moving me on elsewhere. 
I want you to think about the analogy of a, of a father of the bride coming and placing the bride beside the groom. That's this idea of commending to God. One day in the future, the bride of Christ, the church, is going to be presented to Jesus once and for all. And until that day, though, God has entrusted under shepherds with the responsibility of preparing the church for that day. As I commend Salem Baptist Church to God, my prayer is that I have been faithful in my preparation role. Because that has been my role, to prepare you for that day. I pray that God will take this church and purify her and that she will seek to honor him in a special way in the days ahead. Salem, I love you. My wife and I both love you. I mean that with everything inside of me. God has released me from being your pastor. And the peace that comes with that is intense. There's no doubt whatsoever that the Holy Spirit has led in that. I'll continue to preach here for a few weeks to give time to formulate a plan for the deacons and the pastors. But I'm going to be stepping away to allow the other pastors and the deacons to step up and lead. There was a song that was sung at my installation service six and a half years ago that was fairly new to our church at that time. And we've sung it, sung it many, many times since. It's the song, All I Have is Christ. And I'm going to invite Pastor Harper and Josh, come on forward so you can lead us in this. Caleb. The third verse goes like this. And this is how I want for us to end this service today, by singing this out together. It says, now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose and let my song forever be. My only boast is you. That's my prayer for myself, my family. That's my prayer for you as individuals, but that's my prayer for our church as well. Church, let's stand and sing, all I have is Christ.